Okay, so um, the next speaker is myself. Um, so my uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Seathram, uh, has agreed to introduce me. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to do that. Uh, Dr. Dunn's a co-director um, at the Pacific Center for Reproductive Medicine with me, and she's an advocate for education at all levels, including amongst colleagues and patients. And um, she's got too many uh, um, achievements to mention on this introduction, but it's really been a pleasure to, to work with her all these years and to be her friend. And I'd like to introduce you all to, to Dr. Dunn. All right, thank you, Ken. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So um, my talk is called Common Fertility Concerns and How to Manage Them in the Community. Um, I am going to talk about letrozole, which is off-label, and I am going to use the terms woman and female, but that's not uh, meant to exclude um, trans and non-binary people from the discussion about fertility options. Uh, in terms of an introduction, really, the purpose of this talk is to empower you in the community to provide fertility care to your patients. Maybe that's ordering tests and investigations and treatments. Um, maybe you want to send them to us and nothing is ordered and that's absolutely fine as well. But I hope to use this time to update you on some of the, the, the newest um, guidelines in our field. So I thought I would do that with a case-based approach. Um, I chose PCOS as the first case because I'm sure you see it all the time. We know that it is the most common endocrinopathy in women of reproductive age. It affects about 10 to 13 percent of people. And probably because of the heterogeneity of symptoms, um, the diagnosis is often delayed. About 75% of PCOS is estimated to go unrecognized in clinical care. And that can lead to dissatisfaction on the part of the patients. So let me cut right to the chase. Um, I chose PCOS because there is a brand new guideline uh, published in 2023, hot off the press, published by the European Society of Human Reproduction. Um, and I want to walk you through some of the most salient points. Now, for those of you who remember um, the history of guidelines, you probably learned at some point the Rotterdam criteria, which were published in 2003. And then if you saw me or any of my colleagues talk before today, you would have heard about the International Evidence-Based Guideline from 2018. And the good news is that if you have memorized any of that stuff, it's still relevant. The 2023 guideline builds on both of those prior guidelines. So uh, the Rotterdam criteria um, at its core requires two out of three things. So you need oligo or anovulation, clinical or biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovaries. And then there's the exclusion criteria. And it used to be, and when I was training this laundry list of quote unquote PCOS workup labs that we would order for patients. Now, the good news is now a lot of those are no longer required as first line. And that's as a result of this 2018 guideline, which was a very big document, 166 recommendations, 200 pages. Um, but really what it did is take the Rotterdam criteria and that still holds true, but it made the diagnosis more clinical, more patient friendly, and really focused on quality of life and evidence-based treatments. So fast forward now to 2023 in this brand new guideline. And really what this aims to do is, quote unquote, fill the gaps that were left by the 2018 guideline. So what I want to focus on today are some of the key updates. One of them is the simplified, simplified diagnostic algorithm. So this now includes AMH uh, when looking for polycystic ovary morphology. Um, it does emphasize recognizing the comorbidities and metabolic risk factors, as well as the psychological, um, uh, the psychological impacts of PCOS. And it talks about evidence-based medical therapy aiming for the cheapest, most accessible fertility treatment possible. So let's talk about how to apply this guideline in the setting of a case. Um, imagine we have a 24-year-old woman, nulliparous, who's in your office saying, doctor, my periods are all over the place. Sometimes they're 50 days apart, sometimes they're three months apart. 
In order to diagnose this patient, the 2018 algorithm for the most part is still relevant. So um, we take a stepwise approach rather than that laundry list approach from before. And step one um, is amenable to virtual health and it simply is a menstrual history. A lot of patients use an app for this um, and there are refined def definitions in the guideline, but really for most patients for most intents and purposes, if you use 21 to 35 days or eight periods a year, then that would be the definition of oligomenorrhea. We can also investigate for clinical hyperandrogenism on virtual health. Um, and that really is about a patient's perception of hirsutism, acne, and alopecia. This uh, diagram is the Ferriman Galway score, looking at nine predominantly male um, hair growth areas on the body, but it's not uh, strictly necessary that you score each patient. Really, it's focusing on their perception. So if the patient has clinical hyperandrogenism and irregular cycles, then you have your diagnosis of PCOS and you can move on to treatment. If there is no clinical hyperandrogenism, then you may wanna test for biochemical hyperandrogenemia. And the recommended test is a serum testosterone. Here in BC at Life Labs, you'll get a total testosterone. In Alberta, you'll more likely get a free androgen index or a bioavailable testosterone. And those would be accompanied by a normal range. So if it's above the normal range, you have hyperandrogenemia. Um, because the birth control pill increases sex hormone binding globulin through the liver, you need at least a three-month washout period um, in order to get an accurate measurement after being on the, hormo after being on the hormonal contraceptive. Now, if there's no clinical and no biochemical hyperandrogenism, then we move on to looking for polycystic ovary morphology. And in the old guideline, the only way recommended to do that was with ultrasound. And because it's transvaginal ultrasound, it was reserved for adults and non-virginal patients. And what they were looking for was an ovarian volume greater than 10 mils or more than 20 follicles in an ovary. So just a reminder of sort of the normal physiology. Um, in a normally functioning hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, you have the follicle stimulating hormone that comes from the pituitary. It stimulates the follicle to grow. And as that follicle grows, it makes estrogen. At some point in the middle of the cycle, when the follicle is ready, the brain sends out a strong signal in the form of LH ovulation occurs, and then progesterone is produced by this remaining structure called the corpus luteum. In PCOS, it looks more like this. You have this inversion where you have more LH than FSH. And what that results in is this hyperandrogenic microenvironment. And these tiny follicles never really grow to the size of ovulation. So what you end up with is a buildup of these tiny little follicles or polycystic ovary morphology. And the LH leads the ovary to make androgens, which can lead to that clinical hyperandrogenism. Now, every once in a while, um, ovulation might happen and the patient may have a period, but it's not happening cyclically like it should. So how can we use AMH in this setting? Um, in terms of looking for um, polycystic ovary morphology, just a reminder that AMH is made by these granulosa cells, these purple cells that we see here. And those cells are present in all follicles, but AMH is only produced by the granulosa cells in the small antral and preantral follicles. So these tiny little ones that we see in the quote unquote string of pearls appearance in the, in the, um, in the polycystic ovary. So uh, when the follicle gets large or pre-ovulatory, it stops making AMH. And that's why AMH is constant or relatively constant throughout the cycle. So a patient can go walk into the lab. In BC, we have to pay $74. In Alberta, it's covered. Um, and they can go any day of the month and get their AMH. Now, the only issue in this updated guideline is there is no strict cutoff. So they don't provide cutoffs. And probably that's because there are different assays. And of course, there's variation from lab to lab in terms of their reference ranges. So um, what I've provided you here, I think is helpful to keep because when Life Labs gives you the reference range, it's way too broad to help with this diagnosis. Um, on the graph, you can see 
pico moles per liter here, and that's the, the units that we use in Canada, and the patient's age here along the x-axis. So um, because ovarian reserve declines as people get older, then you have to use an age-specific reference range, and you can see it listed here in terms of percentiles for the AMH value. There was also a publication that looked at sensitivity and specificity with different AMH values, and you can see like for our 24-year-old patient, for example, if her AMH is higher than 40.7 picomolars, then that's going to be highly sensitive for polycystic ovary morphology on ultrasound. So this patient, we're speaking to her on virtual health. She's got irregular periods. She says, I don't know if I have hirsutism. You know, my mom looks the same. My sister looks the same. It's hard to say. So you went ahead and you ordered some labs. Uh, her testosterone came back in the normal range, but on the higher side. Uh, her AMH is high, 59 picomolars. Her TSH, her prolactin, and her FSH were ordered for those diagnoses of exclusion, and they're all normal. So now we can say that she has oligomenorrhea and probably polycystic ovary morphology, and therefore she meets the criteria for PCOS. I just also want to point out that it's kind of helpful to order AMH in the setting of um, virtual health, because let's say, for example, her AMH wasn't 59. Let's say it came back and it was 0 0.9. Well, automatically now we know we're not dealing with a high egg count. We're not dealing with polycystic ovaries. We're actually dealing with perimenopause. We're dealing with a very low egg count. So I think it can help to send you down the right path more quickly. Now, when it comes to treating this patient, the most important question is, do you want to be pregnant or do you not want to be pregnant? Uh, because if the patient does not want to be pregnant, then both for hirsutism and for oligomenorrhea, OCP is first line. So that's really quite straightforward. Um, if the patient does want to be pregnant, then we're going to do ovulation induction. And first line still, according to this guideline, is letrozole. So the dose is 2.5 milligrams orally from cycle days three to seven. Um, you can test for ovulation. Some patients prefer to go to the lab. And if the progesterone is elevated, we use a cutoff of 10 nanomolars, but really any source of progesterone um, is coming from the ovaries. If she's ovulating, then you stay on the same dose. If she's not, then you may want to move up to two pills per day, which is five milligrams, or three pills per day, which is 7.5 milligrams. If the patient is not um, having periods regularly at, at all, then you may want to induce a withdrawal bleed to get started with um, the treatment. And that could be like Provera, Medroxy, Progesterone, Acetate, 10 milligrams for 10 days. Um, just for your reference, this is actually still in press, but this is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine summary. Um, and just to show you that the light blue pathway in the middle um, is the best practice um, guideline. So again, letrozole being first line, but I'll point out that there is a role still for clomiphene plus metformin as an alternative treatment with the appropriate counseling. So we give our patient a prescription for the birth control pill. Um, and then I just want to point out that it is important to assess her other comorbidities, particularly the diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors. So the guideline does recommend a 75 gram OGTT in all patients um, diagnosed with PCOS, but it says that hemoglobin A1C is an acceptable um, alternative. Um, we want to, of course, take note of her BMI, baseline lipids, and annual blood pressure measurement. And then consider the uh, psychological issues like body image, uh, depression, obstructive sleep apnea, um, endometrial hyperplasia prevention, and her overall quality of life. And I'll just point out here that I wrote um, an article for UBC CPD. This changed my practice. Um, it does make reference to AMH, although it's based on the, the older guidelines, but you might find that helpful as well. Okay, so topic number two is recurrent miscarriage. So this is a 39-year-old woman, G3, um, SAB3. She recently had a miscarriage at about seven or eight weeks. She took a course of Mifigai Miso for the treatment of completed miscarriage, um, which, as you know, is 200 milligrams of mifepristone, um, and that's the progesterone receptor antagonist that makes the misoprostol that causes the uterine contractions more effective. So 
she's through the miscarriage and now she's in your office and she's saying, doctor, why does this keep happening? She's crying. She's upset. What can we do to prevent this in the future? So uh, again, I wanted to fill this talk with as many critical pearls and updated guidelines as possible. So this one is another updated guideline. It's dated 2022, but actually the final version was just published in 2023. And again, it's by the European Society of um, Human Reproduction. Um, they make the definition of recurrent pregnancy loss two or more pregnancies. And the asterisk there is because they spe specify that they should be more than six weeks. Um, so either a clinical miscarriage or um, the gestational age was estimated to be more than six weeks. Let's review the investigations that might be indicated for our patient. So the first thing is genetic testing. Um, should we order karyotypes on this patient? The guideline says that parental karyotyping can be considered. In a patient with two or more miscarriages, about two to 3% will be found to have a balanced reciprocal or Robertsonian translocation in either partner. Um, karyotyping here can take some time, you know, usually about three months from when we order it to when we get the results back. Um, genetic analysis of the miscarriage tissue. So should we ask the patient to collect the miscarriage tissue and bring it in for analysis? The guideline says it's not routinely rec recommended, but it could be considered for explanatory purposes. Um, at BC Women's Hospital, they will do the cytogenetic testing at the time of the second consecutive pregnancy loss, more than 10 weeks gestation. And if you fill out this embryo pathology consultation request, the first result you're going to get back, usually pretty quickly, um, is the QF-PCR. And that's looking at the sex chromosomes and six of the most common chromosomes that are um, implicated in, in miscarriage. If that one is abnormal, like this showing trisomy 13, then the analysis ends there. If it's normal, uh, then they would do a chrom chromosomal microarray. And that's looking at um, the... Um, the subchromosomal, like subaneuploidy, as well as the, the rest of the chromosomes for any abnormalities. So your patient can drop off the specimen in a clean container to the second floor of um, BC Children's Hospital. Moving on to thrombophilia screening, what's recommended? Um, it's recommended to do this after two pregnancy losses, looking at antiphospholipid antibodies. So these are acquired uh, antibodies, lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, and beta-2 glycoprotein. Um, if they are abnormal, then you repeat the test in 12 weeks. But keep in mind that just an abnormal measurement does not mean the patient has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. In order to have the syndrome, they actually need one clinical and one lab criteria. So either the thrombosis or the obstetrical complications, which are listed there. Um, if they truly have any phospholipid antibody syndrome, then the treatment is aspirin preconception and low molecular weight heparin once they're pregnant. The guideline uh, reaffirms that we do not recommend testing for inherited thrombophilias like antithrombin, prothrombin, factor V lidin. In terms of other tests, there's a strong recommendation for screening for um, thyroid and TPO antibodies. Um, ANA antibodies um, are associated with miscarriage, although there's no agreed upon treatment, so they're mainly done for explanatory purposes if you do them. Uh, prolactin testing is, in the guideline, only recommended if there's oligomenorrhea and clinical hypoprolactinemia. However, if there is hyperlactin, they recommend treating it. So some of us have decided to keep prolactin on our recurrent pregnancy loss panel. Uh, some form of uterine anatomy assessment is recommended. So the guideline prefers transvaginal 3D ultrasound. Um, you can see in this picture um, down in the lower left corner, this is a normal 3D ultrasound that uh, I took for uh, one of my patients. Um, and then in this picture, you can see that there are um, two uterine cavities here with a full uterine septum. So that's a nice 3D ultrasound picture. Sona histogram is something that um, they do at, uh, at uh, Gregan Associates Private Pay. We also do it at PCRM, uh, where saline goes into the uterus. 
And you can see here that the black here is saline. And then there's this round lesion, probably a fibroid within the, the endometrial cavity. Um, MRI is not first line. Um, and if you do see a Mullerian anomaly, then uh, just a reminder to image the kidneys in the urinary tract. Uh, for those of you who do endometrial biopsy, um, it's not routinely recommended. However, um, there are studies that have shown that when women have endometritis or plasma infiltrate in the endometrium, antibiotics have significantly reduced um, the chance of miscarriage and improved live birth rate, sub live birth rate subsequently. Um, but there's no RCT data on this one. Here's the laundry list of tests that are not recommended, and I don't need to go through all of them, but suffice to say that unfortunately this is a predatory area of medicine where um, companies will offer testing and, and, and false hope that's not evidence-based, so it's important to know what we don't want to test our patients for based on the current, the current evidence. Um, okay, so let's talk about treatments. The most important thing, and it's really stressed in this guideline, is support. Um, so patients who have miscarriage, even one miscarriage, um, can have feelings of loss and of grief, a sense of personal failure. Um, and it's really important as healthcare providers that we validate these feelings. Um, we show compassion, understanding. Um, and then we have the clear information to counsel them and, and guide them towards next steps. Most of these counseling points, I'm not gonna read them all out because I think they're probably second nature um, to most of you in terms of folic acid and BMI. I just wanna point out that the guideline explicitly says that stress itself is not a cause of pregnancy loss. So patients tend to use this to sort of to blame themselves. Um, how should we treat uterine factors? So for the gynecologists and residents in the room, I will say, um, the guideline says that overall the evidence is limited and insufficient. So there's no standard recommendation. If you look more specifically at the different lesions, um, the uterine septum issue, it's interesting because past observational and meta-analyses have indicated a benefit of taking out septums. There was a small randomized control trial published in 2021 that showed no benefit of taking out septums. Um, so I, I think this is really case by case basis based on the current current evidence. Um, uterine polyps, um, the guideline says to consider taking out larger polyps more than one centimeter. Why did they choose one centimeter? Uh, really the cutoff was chosen because they say 27% of polyps less than a centimeter regress within a year. Um, so again, I think that would be a case by case basis. In terms of submucous fibroids, there's really no good studies on recurrent pregnancy loss specifically and submucous fibroids, but the AAGL guideline concluded that in selected patients, there could be a benefit of hysteroscopic myomectomy. What about the unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss? This is a lot of patients that we see. Should we give them progesterone? Um, the guideline looked at uh, a number of well done large studies. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the PROMISE trial, which showed no benefit of vaginal progesterone. Um, but then meta analysis incorporating more data um, found that in patients who had had three or more miscarriages, vaginal progesterone may improve live birth rate. Um, the dose that they used in that setting was 400 milligrams PVBID until 16 weeks. The good news is that progesterone is relatively low cost and very safe. So if patients choose or ask me to take it, I don't usually argue with them about it because I know that it's, that it's low risk and it may help uh, or, it, or it may not. Um, in terms of treatments that are not recommended, um, these, again, are really important because patients are seeking them sometimes with us and sometimes overseas. Um, this is, again, a list, but I'll point out things like lymphocyte immunization therapy, um, high-dose glucocorticoids, IVIG, intralipid, um, not recommended in this guideline. And, and in certain situations, like with the lymphocyte immunization or IVIG or intralipid, they can actually be associated with serious and significant um, side effects. Probably the most important thing we can do is to reassure and counsel our patients in a sensitive way that the best predictor of their future fertility and um, reproductive success is actually female age and their reproductive history. 
So if we take our patient, we can see here that the blue bars represent euploid embryos. Red is, is when there's one, um, one incidence of, of aneuploidy. Um, green is where there's two and purple is where there's three. So you can see here that in our 39-year-old patient, she already had a more than 50% chance of an aneuploid conception, just purely based on her age. Um, and then in terms of prognosticating, this is from the new guideline, and this may be helpful for you in your offices. I'll point out here that even though our patient is 39 and has had three miscarriages, she still has a roughly 45% chance that the next pregnancy will result in a live birth. So those odds are, are still, you know, quite positive. All right, so in conclusion, um, age is a really important factor to all of our patients in any fertility setting. Uh, when it comes to PCOS, I would refer you to the new and updated guidelines from 2023, which include AMH for PCO morphology that might alleviate some of the burden on ultrasound. Uh, we don't talk a lot about men, but the new guidelines, um, they do stress that we need to think about men from an emotional support perspective, but also optimizing their lifestyle in terms of BMI, smoking, alcohol. Um, and then finally, when it comes to recurrent pregnancy loss, the basic workup, evidence based is TSH, antiphospholipid antibodies, uterine assessment and karyotypes, plus or minus the prolactin, uh, prometrium for more than three miscarriages, and really just thinking about support for these patients. All right. Um, and now I'll take any questions. So um, I'm happy to navigate my own Q&A bar here. Um, okay, so there's one question. Does PCRM have an, a BMI upper limit where ovulation induction will be offered to patients with PCRS? Is it offered to all patients after informed discussion risk and benefits with high BMI? This is a very difficult uh, topic, especially because um, obviously very sensitive and we don't want to be discriminatory. Um, with, with patients with a BMI over 45, um, our clinic policy generally is to try to get their BMI lower than 45 before we will do ovulation induction. I think presented in the right way, it's generally, um, generally well, well received um, in that regard. Um, is AMH always associated with low AMH always associated with near menopause? Uh, yeah, basically AMH is, is made by the follicles. If, if there's no follicles, there's no eggs, there's no AMH. Um, so, um, it can vary a little bit like in, in, you know, young girls and teenagers it sort of peaks around 25, but if you have somebody who's of reproductive maturity with a low AMH, they have low ovarian reserve. It's a poor predictor of menopause. The error bars on either side are wide. So if someone has a low AMH, I can't tell you they're going to go into menopause three months or three years from now. Um, but, uh, but it's associated with low ovarian reserve or poor response at, at IVF. Uh, can you explain why you don't recommend sperm DNA fragmentation testing? Because some fertility clinics do recommend it. Okay. So um, yeah, just because of the, the, the constraint of time, I didn't go too much into this. Certainly the urologists, and, and there is evidence that, that sperm DNA fragmentation is associated with recurrent um, pregnancy loss. I think the next step though is routine testing is not recommended because in the guideline, there's no agreed upon treatment. Is it is it varicocele ligation? Is it antioxidants? Is it ICSI with IVF? Is it lifestyle modifications? And is there good data that that results in higher live birth? The answer is no. Things like antioxidants have been associated with, um, for example, better embryo development, but, they, but they're not strictly, uh, like there's not good data to say that they result in more live birth. So could it be considered for explanatory purposes? I think that our urologist colleagues would say yes. Um, patients often ask for insulin levels in PCOS, often advised by naturopath, your opinion, please. Um, well, it's not recommended in the guideline. Uh, I'm not sure how many of the family doctors with more expertise with diabetes do fasting insulin um, in, in, their, in their practice. Um, but uh, you, the recommendation is, is to check for um, a 70 gram, 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. Um, if they're fasting, insulin is high, um, but their glucose challenge test is normal. Um, we, we should probably ask Dr. Hugit Penner how, how she would address that actually. Let's ask her to how to how to circle back on that one. Um, 
Role of metformin in the management of PCOS. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about metformin in the management of diabetes because Dr. Hugh Penner um, is much more of an expert in that than I am. Um, there is randomized control trial data published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, from the PPCOS-1 and PPCOS-2 trials that looked at metformin versus Clomid and Clomid was better. The PPCOS-2 trial compared Clomid against Clomid plus metformin, and there was a trend towards the combination being better, but they were actually not statistically better. So where do we add in metformin? We typically would add it into those patients who are, and, the, and this is outlined in the guideline, I just didn't have time to give you the details, in patients who are at risk or who have impaired glucose tolerance. So those would be those with um, impaired glucose tolerance family history, high-risk ethnicity, um, obesity, um, history of glucose intolerance, those types of things who are not responding to um, ovulation induction, like with Clomid. Um, I'm just looking at my time here. I think I have three minutes. Um, should we recommend letrozole for patients with PCOS right away when trying to conceive for a few months of natural cycles, even if abnormal lengths? Does this lead to poor egg quality of cycles or very long? Um, I would say if the patient has oligomenorrhea and they're trying to conceive, by all means, I would go with letrozole right away because I think these patients spend a lot of time, money, and mental energy on these ovulation kits and they're peeing on a stick every day. Sometimes their basal LH is high, like I showed you. So that gets false positive OPKs and it can lead to a lot of frustration and frankly, lost time and emotional stress. So if they have oligomenorrhea, um, then the risk of letrozole really is um, very minimal um, other than the three to 5% risk of multiples, minimal side effects, usually some hot flushes, very rare like muscle and bone pain, but it's usually mild hot flushes. So I think um, it's, it would be a safe thing to introduce in the community for oligomenorrhea and ovulation induction, like right away. Um, in a patient, in patient who are 40 plus with three plus losses with unexplained RPL, what wording do you use to counsel them on this like being associated with age in a sensitive way? Would you recommend IVF PGTA to try to transfer genetically normal embryo? Okay, that's a great question. Um, well, they're all great questions. Um, I think we could do an entire talk on PGTA. I'm gonna try to summarize it in like two sentences. Um, in a patient who's 40 plus with three plus losses, my first question to her would be, how many kids do you want? Um, because although she might have a spontaneous pregnancy and live birth of one, a lot less likely for that to happen at 42 or 43. So that might be an argument for making embryos and freezing embryos and testing them. Um, number two is, does PGTA reduce the time to pregnancy? There are studies that have shown that PGTA, although it doesn't improve the cumulative live birth rate in RPL cases, that it may shorten the time to pregnancy, get them pregnant quicker. There are also studies that have shown the opposite. So PGTA is not the panacea that we thought it was going to be for RPL. It's also really expensive. Um, however, a lot of patients do end up there because they're emotionally exhausted and they're thinking about family planning um, and, and they want to do PGTA for recurrent miscarriage. So it's certainly not considered first line, um, but, but we do offer it as an option with the appropriate counseling.